It's time for the hurling power rankings. So many critics, these pundits. I absolutely adore them, lads. I have unbelievable time for them, but they're, they're a great bunch, but it's not acceptable. I'd like to play the hard man when, when they're on it. It's not very pleasant when you're trying to manage a team. All you're looking for is a bit of civility and a bit of decency, but they just dismiss you like, like you, you know, you have nothing to do with the bloody occasion. All right, well, good morning to you. Good morning. We've got new leaders, lads. Oh, dun, 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 dun. I like it. Go on. Mm. Is it Wexford? Is it Cork? That is the real question. I can't it? be Cork. We, it is Cork. What? Yeah. Hey, look at what Cork did last week. Ah, they come went on. to Limerick and one swallow does not a summer make. Hey, they're sitting top of Division where One. Where were they? Where were they before you last week? Uh, I think they were in third place, and now we've put them up, bumped them up to first. Okay, so that's okay. A bit we, of a we, we, Limerick have dropped down a little bit. We've done this in uh, reverse, reverse order. order. Unfortunately. Yeah, do, I, do you want to go through the other ones? Yeah, yeah, go, to go. Let's eight. stick That's to the, the plan. Yeah, that's a little tease for people when we get it further. How far down are Limerick? Uh, James Gell put Limerick in eighth place, which I just can't stand over at this point. Uh, he was called dramatic for doing that by Paul Murphy on the Hurling Pod. I think Paul and I have been a little bit more kind of conservative about where we're putting Limerick, but no doubt you got to respect the fact the first three games they've lost and they've now lost top spot in the power rankings. But is, the, is the Hurling Pod, Will, just a, a, a method for you to like run your power rankings ideas off to legendary hurlers? Is that just the sole purpose of, of that podcast? But I did joke this week home. I said, you can do my homework for me. What we'll do is I'll read out the results. You guys scribble down your power rankings and I'll just steal some of the homework for the top eight and we'll go from there. No, uh, my power rankings are actually still quite different to theirs. Like, scales are far more volatile than mine. Like, a team will lose and scale will more than happily bump them down to seventh or eighth. I that's what they should be. If, if they're week by week, I, I actually think that's exactly what they should be. Can I just say, Will, you know, uh, okay. for, for our radio listeners at home, Owen is shifting very uncomfortably at the moment. Uh, he's he's unhappy with this. He thinks that you are um, getting better information. Mm. You've got a, a broader sweep. It, 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 I think you're coming for his turf and he is very concerned well, about it. No, what I'm really worried about here is Tommy Rooney, actually. He's like looking at what's going on here and he's saying, I can, can I copy and paste this sort of democratic setup and just oust the uh, single dictator of the football power rankings? I think that's what uh, Tommy's thinking. So you've, you've given him ideas of of a more hopeful future, Will, and I'm not happy about that. Oh, there you go. He can, he can pass the homework on to you and you can feed them into your power rankings as well. But look, the lads are only kind of doing the top eight or so. I'm the person who has to go and work out 24 all the way through. All of the counties. The so eight, eventually, so. you remember that there that's were other counties. Good, yeah. yeah. 24 counties. Well I did. And, right, it, only right. took, it only took a month, but that's okay. It only took a few weeks. Even, but here. even the Brits would be happy with a 24 county outcome, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the good news is we kind of decried what was happening with Ulster Hurling, I think, on the first couple of power rankings that we're discussing. And the thing is, on this first quadrant we're going to talk about, where we look at the 24 teams up through to 17, two Ulster teams and two neighbours in the Northwest have flown up the power rankings over the first few weeks. Uh, Donegal, firstly, are the big movers within this quadrant for the first three games. They're up to 20th place. In Division 2B, they've won all of the games so far. Three wins from three up there in second place, just behind their neighbours Derry on scoring difference, and Derry have gone up to 17th, ahead of Kildare and Meath, who are both in Division 2A because of the way that Derry have started this year. So in 24th place, you've got Mayo, a little bit disappointing, They, or sorry, 24th place is Sligo, got their first win last weekend, but still, it's going to be very difficult to get out of Division 2B. You've got Mayo, who took a heavy defeat against Derry last week, they were beaten 424 to 113 on the road. They've got just one point from their first three games. London, just above them, you've got Wicklow, who are currently sitting second bottom in Division 2B, so therefore Donegal had to go ahead of those three teams up into 20th place. Mead have dropped down to 19th on the back of what was a pretty heavy defeat against their neighbours West Mead last weekend in Division 2A, which looks a wide open division, but Mead are now very much in a relegation dogfight, having won their first game against Kildare, it's been downhill for them since then. Kildare, again, excellent win against Down last weekend, which is a big boost for them, and Kildare go into 18th place. Then into uh, 16 up, we look at Down, who lost out to Kildare, so they sit in 16th place. Carlo suffered a blow in their bid to be promoted from Division 2A by losing out to a Conway-inspired Kerry uh, last weekend. So they go down to... Sorry, they sit in 15th place. A dropper had to happen at some point. Offaly have gone down. They faded badly in the last 20 minutes against Clare, who were inspired by Tony Kelly, who came back and scored two goals and 12 points. But Offaly would be really disappointed <laughs> that they were drawing it's, at halftime. 
We take this for granted. We take this for granted. And the thing is that people go, oh, it's only against Offaly, except he does it against everybody. He he will score the the 18 points against anybody any day of the week and twice on Sundays if you ask him to. So That's the ridiculous thing about it, lads. And I I know for Clare it's going to be difficult this year to probably close the gaps to some of the teams above them, but Tony Kelly is that much of a difference maker that he will come in and when a game is in the melting pot, Tony Kelly will just open up and go into superhuman mode and that's what he does and he, I thought it was going to take him a little bit of time and we'll talk about Rory O'Connor in a moment to ease himself back in from injury because he was only doing some of the running drills after Clare's last game before the break comes in to start I was a little suspicious when I saw the team sheet whether he was going to actually start or not and then he comes in and puts in a huge performance so that's a big boost for Clare in the coming weeks and they play Limerick at home this coming Sunday will they smell a little bit of blood in the water with the way that Limerick have started the year and maybe Clare can get a crucial victory um, which will push them back up a little bit higher towards the top of Division 1A we shall see this weekend uh, then you've got after Offaly who've dropped down to 14th I bumped up Kerry on the back of their win away to Carlo Kerry are now very much in the promotion race in Division 2A on the back of that 7 point victory Westmead beat Mead uh, a couple of goals scored by Niall Mitchell during the game. They seem to be moving quite well again after their shock defeat against Carlo in the second round. If they win at home against Down on Sunday, which they'd be expected to do, they'd be very much on course to go to the Division 2A final and they could make a swift return back to Division 1. Leash lost out to Kilkenny again, faded in that game at Nolan Park against a very youthful-looking Kilkenny team. I think Kilkenny will start to bring a bit more experience back in for their game against Dublin, which is a huge one this weekend. Uh, but Leash have got probably one of the games of the weekend. They're on the TV. We have seen so little of Antrim so far which has felt really disrespectful because Antrim gave Kilkenny a good rattle gave Dublin a very good game in Corrigan Park and almost beat Waterford at the weekend who were up towards the top of these power rankings and Neil McManus penalty is tipped over the crossbar with the very last play of the game that could have been a famous Antrim win you put your house on this- yeah, like I was listening to some of the Antrim players later and it wasn't a case of we've had a moral victory or we've played really well no. on this occasion. It was literally we have left two points behind us here which would have probably kept us guaranteed to be in Division 1 for next season. But they go to Port Leash this weekend. Effectively, it's like a relegation playoff semi-final. Whoever wins that game is not going to be in the relegation playoff against Offaly. So that's a huge game. 3.45 TG Carr this weekend. I think it's a really good TV pick from them when there were other games that may have been tempting on Sunday. They picked a game with huge stakes at the wrong end of the table in Division 1B. So we'll see where both Leash and Antrim are probably at the end of this weekend. They sit currently 11th, 10th place. Ninth, I've kept Clare there. Already mentioned Tony Kelly's heroics. They're up and running with a win, which is probably morale boosting with the way the season has started. Away to Offaly last week. They'll feel they just about got the job done, but they'll probably be a bit concerned they left Offaly in the game for as long as they did, and they play against uh, their neighbours Limerick this weekend. That brings us to the front page then of our uh, top eight. And I've put Kilkenny in eighth place once again. They beat Leash, which probably would have been the expectation. The feeling is, talking to Paul Murphy about it, that Kilkenny are going about their work very quietly. It looks from what Brian Cody said last weekend that some of the Ballyhale players, but not TJ Reid, will be back for their game at Parnell Park this weekend. You know, Kilkenny win that game. They put themselves in the chance of getting to a league semi-final. But the way that Dublin are going, lads, Dublin are a couple of places above them in the power rankings now in sixth who, with the exception of Jake Morris playing very well for Tipperary, I thought Dublin did an excellent job on Tipperary's forwards going back uh, to Semple Stadium. Oh, first hang, time since they lost to Cork last year. Hang on. Did we not say that we would put Dublin up if they beat Tip last week? Did we not Did we not agree that Dublin were going to be catapulted forward if they beat Tip? Beat Tip, we'll take you more seriously, we'll put you up, and you're like, you're reneging on your promise to the good people, the good hurling folk of Dublin. <laughs> The, the intention was to put them up, but then what happened was Limerick ended up tumbling a little bit and Galway went down one place. So it wasn't a case of like Dublin have really lost any ground on but the back. Well, they haven't Tipperary. gone up well. You didn't do what you said you'd do. The, the, hey, the I, rankings I just, are broken. I didn't think Cork were going to beat Limerick, all right? That, that was the kind of great disruptor in the top five for this week. Um, but like Dublin have done nothing wrong so far this year. They've won the Walsh Cup. They've now beaten Tipperary to put themselves in a very strong position to qualify for the semi-finals. Unbeaten so far. They backed that up against Kilkenny this weekend. I guarantee you I will put them into the top five for next week. That is a guarantee to the Dublin people. And that's like that's a huge game uh, this weekend too because it's going to say so much about how the final shakeup is going to be in 1B. Then just above them, you've got Galway who go down just the one place on the back of their six-point defeat. A little bit disappointing, the performance on the back of how they were playing before the break that they were then beaten by Wexford put in a patchy performance. The takeaway from it, though, is how important Conor Whelan is going to be at number 14 for Galway this year because they had to kind of shuffle their forward line around as a result of Whelan not being there. So his physicality, which was so important in the Limerick win, was missing. 
but also they had to kind of change the personnel and it didn't quite click in the same way when they played against Wexford. Wexford, who are above them, and we'll talk about Wexford in second place in a moment, uh, go to Cork this weekend. So that's a cracking top of the table clash there uh, to see, or sorry, uh, Galway go to Cork, which is a huge test when they go to the leaders this weekend. You would think that Limerick are going to bounce back, who are in fourth place now when they play against Clare. We talked about everything that they have in the bank. I was listening to Tommy Walsh talking to you guys yesterday. There has to be a definite feeling that Limerick are a little bit below even where they were last year, even though they didn't win in the first three games of the league and they turned out perfectly fine. There's been real experimentation there. Maybe the one thing that John Kiley has learned in these first three weekends of the league that we've seen, lads, are maybe some of those fringe players aren't as good as the players that they've come in to replace because he kind of smashed the glass at halftime at the weekend by bringing on three of his key players at halftime. And that, to me, was a sure indication that he was saying, right, I've got to bring my frontliners back out here. And to credit to Limerick, they won the second half against Cork after being pretty appalling and only scoring five points. I never thought we'd get to a point where Limerick would be as low scoring as they are right now. They're only averaging 16 points a game, which would have been unthinkable last year. They're the lowest scorers on average in Division One of the league this year. Uh, yeah, and, and look, I, I, I understand the concerns, but I, I wouldn't be too concerned about them come championship time, and I think these will be different. But I, I do think that the league form at the moment, I think Scale's right about the current league form and this week. If, if we all had to play a tournament this weekend with these teams as they're currently constituted, that's different from what will happen over the course of the long, slow, unfolding championship in 40 days as it starts, as we know. Um, I definitely would have the dubs higher up at the moment because like Dublin and Waterford drew, Waterford are three points, three places ahead of them. I think, you know, Galway are going to be inconsistent as they find what they're trying to do under Shefflin and that's fine. So it's one week they can be up, one week they can be down. Um, the only caveat to that I would say, Jar, is so far, and maybe this will change as we go into the amazing, we're less than 50 days away from the championship getting underway on Easter weekend, but I think Division 1A looks a little bit stronger than Division 1B based on the way the teams have been so far, and that has definitely played into the waiting a little bit when okay. it comes to this too. But okay, you've got that's fair enough. Uh, a lot of teams in 1A are in good form as well. Wexford, let's talk about them. Like, it's transformational. It's like they've been liberated into something new and different, and it's unbelievably exciting to see their players fit the, the collection of players they have fit at the moment who seem to be very enthusiastic and rested and it's just interesting how much um, new blood can help from a managerial perspective yeah look sometimes the change is just important to rejuvenate a team and the last couple of years they've looked leggy they've looked a little bit tired definitely last year looked like it was clear from the outset that it was going to be Davy Fitzgerald's last dance with that team and you know they didn't get the summer championship performances out of them and Darry Egan has come in and he's definitely liberated their forwards a little bit I think he's made a priority of particularly two key forwards who he wants to get the most out of this year he wants Conor McDonald to be in scoring positions as opposed to some of the drifting that we saw from Conor who's a supreme talent last year and Rory O'Connor has come flying back from his hamstring injury I'm actually surprised by how sharp he has come back. I know you were talking about the Dublin footballers coming back sharp. Like Rory O'Connor missed a nice bit of action both with his college with DCU and also at Wexford start of the year. Comes flying back in. Really good performance against Clare last weekend. He scored five points in the week just gone by against Galway. Three points in play in the first half. And Galway really struggled to deal with him because he's just got, first of all, great pace, but he's got a great hurling brain in how he moves around as well. And it seems that the two of them as inside forwards particularly, are going to be given the opportunity to drift around, get into space and dictate things for Wexford. And it gives Wexford more of a scoring threat than they had last year because Wexford were more about, in a way, stopping the opposition against Davy and then trying to break against you. They hurl a little bit more proactively so far under Darry Egan, which is interesting to watch. And then you take that that Wexford team still have Lee Chin to come back into the team, which will be a big boost to their half-forward line because a lot of these games where they played against the likes of Galway and against Limerick, you would have thought that Chin in recent years and his physicality were so key. It's a wonderful problem for Darry Egan to have is where to fit Lee Chin back into the team when he comes back fully fit and firing. So you can't take away from anything Wexford have done so far. A little bit scrappy, not the best game against Galway last week, but Wexford get a huge win on the road. They should beat Offaly this Saturday lunchtime, and if they do so, they're going to a semi-final in the league. All right, and Cork, the best team in Ireland at the moment? Yeah, I mean, we saw everything that we were disappointed about in Cork in the All-Ireland final last year, they addressed in the game against Limerick, particularly in the first half last weekend. Like, there was bit of hunger, bit of bite about them. We saw again 
great running through the middle of the field. We know that they've got tremendous athletes. Conor Lahan again, played remarkably well. Darfus Gibbon in the middle of the field has carried on the form that we saw in the game against Clare and against Offaly. Like their goalkeeper was being used. If anyone wants to watch the hurling pod, we've got a good breakdown with Scahill about this. As effectively a 15th outfield player last week. The Cork were happy enough on, I think it was 11 different occasions, they recycled the ball back to their goalkeeper and worked the ball back out from the back. So to do that against a Limerick team who are usually very good at pressing up on the opposition as well, showed a bravery about Kingston's side. Shane Kingston got two goals before he was sent off. The sendings off kind of changed the course of the game a little bit. But the way that Cork hurled in that first half, the way that they put Clare to the sword in the first game, this, goal, this Cork team are moving really, really well so far, Jar. I know you've got your scepticism about them, but... I don't I really. I think they're, they've, their red tide is rising, as we've been talking about in the show for years, but it, it has to just get there at some point. Well, can I, can I ask, do you think there is yeah. a, a chance that the magnitude of the defeat in the All-Ireland final last year was just one of those freak occurrences? Not Freak is probably too strong, but just one of those things. Of course, Limerick are the best team in the country. They were certainly better than Cork on the day. But the way they beat them that day, I think we kind of came away from that thinking, right, this red tide, that's going to take years rather than months for that to actually come good and for them to, to potentially win an All-Ireland final. Do you think that they're actually a lot closer, even if you rewind the clocks of last year uh, between these these two teams, the gap is a bit smaller between these two teams than we thought? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's one of those things, you can read an awful lot into a 70-minute performance when it came to the All-Ireland final last year. And like to give Limerick their credit... They sparkled in the All Ireland final. Mm. They just moved the ball around and they took scores at will and playing in a way that they really haven't been playing as freely this year so far in the first three games. But Cork answered so many of those questions on. Like I think what would have annoyed a lot of Cork supporters last year is they went down without a fight in that All Ireland final at all. There wasn't enough tackling. There wasn't enough of that kind of edge and grit that we saw in the Gaelic grounds, particularly in the first half last weekend. They hit so a lot of wides. The, con- the, the confidence drained from the team. Nothing they could do was working. And in the meantime three balls into the forward line, three goals, this game's over, you know? Mm. Yeah, and look, the other thing about this week, Kieran Joyce has been a big addition to the Cork team too, but I was incredibly impressed by how, at this stage, Patrick Horgan is starting to play too, where we've had so long that he had to be the Tony Kelly-like figure that we talked about with Clare, where Horgan was shouldering all of the responsibility scoring-wise. He was actually more than happy to be a bit of an instigator in the attacks last week, making off the ball running where players were just running from deep, which made it very difficult for Limerick to actually contain them because there were so many threats from Cork during the game. I accept, look, this weekend we might say, hey, Cork have lost out against Galway at Porky Cueve and we need to drop them back down to second or third position. But I think no one watching these hurling rankings right now can't be impressed by what Cork have done so far. All right, last question for you. Mark wants to know, did we ever find out who was at the start asking about these critics, these pundits? Yeah, it's Liam Kearns. There you go. I remember, I remember that infamous interview after a. He was the leash manager at the time. Why? Why do you remember it? Because uh, I, re- I was broadcasting. I'm pretty sure I was presenting a Midlands 103 at the time, and it went out maybe not live, but pretty much as live. I think it was a case of the commentary kit may well have been down there, and Liam Kearns uh, was very, very annoyed at the media, and particularly I think some of the local media uh, after the you, game. You were the so critic. He, you were the pundit. Right. Yeah, thank, thankfully, it was, I don't think it was me. I think Liam and I actually got on fairly well, but I think, I think he took umbrage with our commentator at the time and deliberately got his name wrong when having a go at him as well. Which what, was what was pretty the, ice cold stuff from Liam. What was the the general? Uh, I mean, without uh, wandering into any uh, difficult areas here, what what was the general tone of the criticism that had so pissed him off? I, I think Liam was unhappy because I think he felt that some of the Leash media at the time were holding the team to the standard that they were at a few years previously under Mikko where they were contesting for Leinster Championships and they were in All-Ireland quarterfinals and the team was in a bit of a rebuild from the 2003 team at the time but yet I think the feeling was that some of the local media had written that they felt the team was underperforming under Liam Kearns. Right. I can't remember the exact game they lost but I'm pretty sure that was a qualifier maybe in Carlo that night and yeah, he... Decided to uh, have a hit back at the critics, and he that's might have been right. This. He might have been yeah, right. Look, you he, know, it's been a, a like, long dark Chris, age. What have Leash done since? Like, what what have Leash really done in the last kind of this is good, ten like, years or so? The the Kildare Offaly Pincer movement uh, shitting on uh, Leash football is something that you know we're not really supposed to do in public. Will this is this is our our off air material? Yeah. Well, look, they got to what, a couple of Leinster finals where they lost out to Dublin quite comfortably in recent times. But other than that, like, really, we all did that. We all, we've all lost it up at some point, yeah. But like, right. 
But, but realistically, like the Leash footballers, um, I think at that time, I think Liam was actually right that they were on a downward spiral. But the expectations were up, Jerry. You remember, like, Leash had won minors All Ireland and had been very competitive at under 21. Did Leash win a minor All Ireland? They never talk about it. No, I've, I've never heard it mentioned before. I think it may well have played into that 2003 Leinster team. But yeah, <laughs> they, they were, look, the tails were up and expectations maybe were, were a bit higher than what was proven in the subsequent years. Yeah. Well, good stuff. That's this week's power rankings. Cheers, lads. I absolutely adore them lads. I have unbelievable time from them, but they're, they're a great bunch, but it's not acceptable.